Good morning, everybody. Just a few moments ago, you heard the concluding words of the Pledge of Allegiance with liberty and justice for all. And as you all know from your studies of American history, for much of our history, we have not had liberty and justice for all. It's because of a remarkable generation of leaders, because of their work, their dedication, their sacrifice, that America is a better country, far better than it was when I was growing up. We have today one of those great leaders of the civil rights movement to speak to you. I'd like to thank Dr. Clarence Jones and Mrs. Jones today for joining us at Viewpoint School. And my thanks go also to Ron Gilliard and Shelley Sumter Gilliard, Viewpoint parents, for arranging Dr. Jones's visit. But in a larger sense, I would like to thank Dr. Jones for his remarkable lifelong commitment to making the United States a better and more just country. Dr. Jones is currently a scholar, writer, and residence and visiting professor at the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute at Stanford University. As part of Dr. Jones, Dr. King's Innermost Circle Advisors, Dr. Jones served as his personal attorney, fundraiser, speechwriter, and friend. Dr. Jones was the author of the first draft of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, delivered at the 1963 March on Washington one of the most powerful, important moments in 20th century American history. Through his work in the civil rights movement, Dr. Jones has helped to dramatically affect the course of American history. Recently, he wrote his personal account of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, Behind the Dream, the Making of the Speech that Transformed a Nation. And again, I thank Ron Gilliard and Shelley Sumter Gilliard for donating a copy to the library. Please take it out and read it. It's a marvelous, uh, insightful uh, understanding, give you an understanding of that dramatic day and the events that preceded and continued afterwards. On August 28th, Dr. King gave his profoundly moving speech at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington before 250,000 people in a national TV audience. I was 16 years old at the time and keenly interested in current affairs in American history. My family had planned to attend. We lived only 200 miles away in New Jersey, but my mother's sudden illness prevented us from attending. Instead, we watched it at home on our small black and white TV. Shortly into his speech, it was evident that Dr. King's passionate and inspirational words would have a significant historical impact. Indeed, on that afternoon, we were witness to a great event in history. Years later, and for generations to come, Dr. King's words on that day and his remarkable life have had and will continue to have a profound impact upon our nation and indeed upon our world. The crusade for human rights is not a goal only for America, but for many peoples of the world. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Clarence Jones. I was at the home of a faculty member at Stanford University, and we were watching the uh, election returns as reported on, on television on that night, watching to see the results from the presidential election of Senator Barack Obama from Illinois versus Senator John McCain from Arizona, who was a Republican nominee. When the networks had uh, declared that Senator Barack Obama, nominee uh, presidential designate, uh, had won sufficient uh, votes in the Electoral College to be declared the official winner of the presidency in the election of two, November 2008, so that he now would be called President-elect Obama. 
several people in the room, people the age was like 30 to 75 or long or older, several people in the room uh, immediately burst into tears and uh, or or like me in my case, my eyes filled with tears. And one of the members, people in the room asked me, Professor Jones, did you ever think you would live long enough to see an African American elected president of the United States? And I said, no. And they were about ready to ask me another question and I continued. And I said, but my tears are not for the successful election of Senator Obama. My tears are for all of those persons whom I personally knew, who worked often 24 seven, some of whom lost their lives to make the election of Senator Obama as President of the United States possible. His election, they were people that I referred to, not so much then, but uh, last month when I was getting an award at the Kennedy Center in Georgetown University, and I was making the same point I, 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 I cited, I recited, in fact, I accepted the award in the name of Martin Luther King Jr. and one very dear friend of mine, Stanley David Levison. They were all, except for those two, they were known, but there were many people that I referred to as unknown wintertime soldiers who worked so hard to make America a better place. And that it was their sacrifice that made Senator Obama, Senator Obama, election as the 44th president of the United States possible. It is fitting that I or someone come and talk to you about Martin Luther King Jr. or his legacy. Is it, also, it is also fitting that there be some momentary comment about so-called Black History Month. It is a very reasonable question to ask if you have not asked or you have not thought about it. Why is there such a thing as Black History Month? Why, for example, is there no Irish History Month, no French History Month, no German History Month, no Scandinavian History Month, no Swedish History Month? African Americans generically referred to as blacks, were the only ethnic group in America whose forefathers and foremothers were enslaved, held in chattel slavery, in bondage within the same country, under the same constitution under the same national government, not this particular, you know, but an earlier national government to which this government is a successor government. The only group of people who were held in bondage and enslaved. And during that period of time that they were held in slavery, it was a serious criminal offense, a felony, for any person, anybody, any third party, to teach 
a slave to read. It was indeed a criminal offense for a slave to try to teach themselves to read. There, the slave-holding government at the time, the slave-holding governments in the states where slavery was rampant, was abundant, it was deemed at the time that slaves had no history worth recording. They had no history, no past worth recording, nothing to learn about. And so therefore, in a historical environment where it is a crime to learn to read and a crime to teach somebody else to learn to read, it's very difficult to be able to create a legacy of history that you could go back and read about because there was no history that was recorded other than limited history of slaves who wrote about their condition or limited history of people who were not slaves, but who wrote about their condition. Or if you want to get the best sense of what slavery was really like, there's a two volume work. Wouldn't be something that at your stage in school that you would even consider. But in Congress, there is a secretary uh, what amounts to a person in the Congress who records everything that's written, everything that's spoken, everything that takes place on the Congress of the United States is officially recorded. It's called the Congressional Record. The uh, Secretary of the Congress from 1860 to 1880 was a man by the name of James Gillespie Blaine. And James Gillespie Blaine, as was his responsibility, recorded every conversation, every debate, every word that took place in Congress between 1860 and 1880. And those were the periods where America was wrestling to decide what it was going to do with this institution of slavery. So if you go and read some of those records, you will see that the representatives in the Congress were very aware of slavery and they were wrestling with what to do with this institution. So it was very hard or very difficult for, their, for people including the people themselves, the people, including descendants, including African-American descendants of former slaves, to know anything about their own history and culture unless there was some, unless they had to uh, learn about it. And so years ago, it uh, was determined that at least one month a year would be set aside so that the nation's schools would learn something about so-called black history. As I have, and I will say later on, as we hope will, well, the point I want to make is that uh, we are hopeful that we will are on a direction where the life experiences, historical life experiences of 12% of the population, their ancestors, will become fully incorporated into the general educational uh, curricula of schools so that there may come a day <clears throat> when it won't be necessary to have a month for black history. America, Oh, it was Martin Luther King Jr.
a great debt. Prior to America, prior to Martin Luther King Jr., America, our country, was like an addict, like a, uh, someone who had become so used to using a substance, abusing themselves on a substance, whether it be alcohol or cocaine, marijuana or heroin. Country was like an addict, addicted to racial segregation. And had tried unsuccessfully to break or shake that addiction. It tried so hard that it had a civil war in an effort to break that addiction. 600,000 men, all Americans from the South and the North, living in the same country, killed and slaughtered one another over this question as to whether slavery should remain as an institution in the country or whether it should be abolished. Part of that success was achieved in 1863 after the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 when Abraham Lincoln passed an executive order called the Emancipation Proclamation. It was issued in September of 1962 to be effective at midnight on January 1st, 1963. And it the wording of it, in effect, said that all persons who are enslaved or in bondage are affected as of midnight of that day, free, no longer slaves. That's 1863. And before that, even before the Emancipation Proclamation, there had been an effort on the part of a person by the name of Dred Scott to sue for his freedom had something called the Dred Scott decision, where it went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, and then the Supreme Court of the United States said in 1857 to the slave who was seeking to free, said he shouldn't be a slave. Chief Justice Taney of the Supreme Court at the time said, a slave has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. And then after 1863, some states still wanted to have segregation and wanted to create something called separate but equal. And a, uh, a young a person from Louisiana by the name of Plessy refused or did not want to ride in a segregated railroad coach, so he sued the state of Louisiana and the railroad coach in a case that went up to the Supreme Court in 1896 under the caption of Plessy v. Ferguson. And that case established the case law and the law of the land at that time that seg racial segregation was okay, that you could have racial segregation, you could be separate as long as it was equal. And then in 1954, the next century, a unanimous Supreme Court in the decision called Brown versus the Board of Education determined that this, this um, uh, charade of racial separation being equal was constitutionally uh, incorrect, violated all of the major provisions of the United States Constitution, particularly the 14th Amendment. And so separate but equal segregation in public education was deemed constitutionally um, impermissible, violated the rights. So that was a major step. But still, the practices of segregation continued in many states. Even after Brown versus the Board of Education, and along comes this fourth generation Baptist preacher from Georgia, 
who's why I say we owe a great debt. Because he became acutely aware of America's dependency and addiction to racial segregation and had become acutely aware of the efforts of America to shake its addiction, unsuccessful efforts. But what he was able to do was that he was able to take America's conscience on a nonviolent journey, a journey which forced America to publicly confront, forced America's conscience to publicly confront the contradiction between the way in which it treated 8, 12% of the population through racial segregation and the precepts and principles enshrined in the Declaration of Independence and, and the Constitution. And said, this is, you, you, you've got to reconcile this. And you can reconcile this peacefully. You can reconcile this by taking some counsel with your soul, with your God, by reflecting on who we want to be as a nation. And so he was able to lead America peacefully on a journey of extraordinary recovery and self-discovery to shake its dependency and addiction to racial segregation and, able, and to enable us and to enable America for the first time to reconcile and redeem its soul. Now, part, Martin Luther, the doctor in Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., by the way, was a PhD. Uh, he had a PhD in theology. Fourth generation Baptist preacher. His father, grandfather, great grandfather before him were all Baptist preachers. He got a degree in theology from the Boston School of Theology. He was erudite. He was a, people forget that he was a religious person before he was a civil rights leader and became annoyed during the, post, during the period of time that he was so acclaimed as a civil rights leader because he felt that that obscured his true essence, that he was indeed a minister of the gospel. One of the courses I teach at the graduate school at Stanford University, I teach this course as a result of the faculty of the Graduate School of Continuing Studies coming to me and asking whether I could suggest a course that I thought would be constructive and helpful about it in American history for those students from Stanford who were enrolled in a credit course to get a master's degree in liberal arts. And so I thought for a moment, and I said, how can one truly be an educated person with a master's degree in liberal arts unless they have visited and taken the time out to understand something about the institution that formed the nation as we are. So I designed a course with the syllabus and extensive reading this. The course was from slavery to Obama. It was the first year. Second year it was slavery to Obama and the president's election of 212, which I just finished last semester. And during that course, this is stadium seating a lot, so it's, it's a course for, it's a graduate seminar, smaller group. It's two and a half hours for graduate students. It's held once a week, but it's really extensive. I mean, it's heavy duty working and reading the term paper required, and it's part of the requirements for their thesis for getting a master's degree. And at Stanford, I don't know whether it's 
in high school here, but at this, not just at Stanford, but many universities because of the universal talent, the universal use of the laptop. Many, most of the students, while they're listening in class, unless the professor objects to it, and I don't, they are listening and they're working on their laptop. They're not, they're not uh, looking at some obscure, they're not looking at some website. They're really taking notes about what you're talking to them. So I said during this particular time, when we get to that part of the history, uh, from, from, the, from slavery and the Civil War and getting up uh, more current times, we get to the, the period of time in history in the 1960s with Martin Luther King Jr. I said to them, this is one, I'm going to tell you something now. And this is the one thing that whether you put it in your laptop or whether you write it out by hand, it's the one thing I want you to write down and to remember. This is not a course in which we give you a test. This is a course in which you write an extensive term paper on the subject, which is a long process, but they have to submit to me the subjects that they want to write about. The subject gets approved, and then they write the term paper, and then I grade the paper. But I said, this is the one thing I want you to write down so that it's part of your notes. And if you don't remember anything else I said here this morning, if you can't remember anything else I said other than what I'm now going to tell you, then remember this. In 12 years and four months, from 1956 to April 4th, 1968, with the exception of Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, Martin Luther King Jr. may have done more to achieve political, racial, social justice and equality in the United States than any other single event or person in the previous 400 years of our country. That was Martin Luther King Jr. Let me put it another way. I sometimes get asked, Professor Jones, who do you think today is most like Martin Luther King Jr.? And so, because of my training and going to a religious Catholic school many years, educated by Irish nuns. I, I remember a Latin. I had so much Latin that when I went to public high school, I was exempt from Latin. I didn't have to take Latin when I went to public high school because I had seven years of Latin, six, seven years of Latin, intensive Latin. And there's a Latin phrase called sui generis, S-U-I, G-E-N-E-R-I-S. It means unique, one of a kind. So when I'm asked that question, I answer the question with my question to the person who asked me the question. Who do I think is like Martin Luther King Jr.? And so I ask them, who today is most like Leonardo da Vinci. Who today is like Michelangelo? Who today is like Galileo, Copernicus, Aristotle, Shakespeare, Beethoven, Mozart? No one. If and most of you were not. So I have to use an example. But if you were alive from 1956, if you were fortunate enough to be alive from 1956 until April 4th, 1968, the date that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, and you went outside at midnight and looked up at the sky, and you saw in this star-studded sky 
a shooting star of such incandescent brightness across the heavens, brighter than any other shooting star that had ever been seen before in the skies. That shooting star was Martin Luther King Jr. We will never, ever, 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 ever see a shooting star of that brightness again in our lifetime or in a millennium. Martin Luther, the template of Martin Luther King Jr. was courage, religious commitment, and the pursuit of personal and educational excellence. If he were alive today, he would challenge you to be the very best that you can be. I have been blessed with the accidental gift of longevity. He only lived to the age of 39. Last month, I celebrated my 81st birthday. If, if, if he had been alive, his birthday, my birthday was on January 8th. His was on January 19th. If he had been alive today, he would be 83. He was two years older than me. You are a successor generation and beneficiary of his legacy. I used to be in the investment banking business. And after I came to Stanford and after I wrote a couple of books, a number of people who knew I was in the investment banking business and knew about my relationship with Martin King, I would frequently get invited. So I've, I've spoken at managers' conference of General Electric where they have 1,500 managers from all over the world. I've spoken to Citigroup the Federal Reserve Bank, um, different institutions. I gave the commencement address last December at the University of San Francisco's College of Arts and Sciences, and they were gracious enough to award me a doctoral degree of, in uh, humane letters. And I've had uh, a chance to speak around the country to different groups. Older colleagues of yours in high school speaking to you. And when I speak to young people whom I really prefer to speak more than any other group of people, and that is because I know, even if you may not know it yet, that indeed, you are the generation that he worked so hard and died for. The so-called I have a dream speech, which was a speech which I drafted the first seven or nine paragraphs to as suggested material that he would consider because that's what I did uh, as his personal lawyer. And we had discussions about what he was going to say on August 28, 1953. So I handed him on August 27th in the evening a, a yellow, piece of yellow paper in which I said, when you're going upstairs to do the speech, you should consider using this 
Usually you don't want to use it, but you know, I, I knew what the pattern was. So I'm standing on the platform behind him on August on Wednesday, August 28th, after the chairman of the march, uh, Asa Philip Randolph, says, ladies and gentlemen, now the moment that we've all been waiting for, the undisputed moral leader of, the, of our country. I am pleased to present to you the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and more than 250,000 people on a Wednesday afternoon before the Lincoln Monument erupted in just unbelievable. And he speaks. And I'm standing 25 feet behind him. And I'm listening to his speech. And only then uh, did I learn by listening to the speech, the opening of the speech, that he had used the suggested text, the text of the opening paragraph that I had suggested without changing a word, a sentence, a comma, or anything. Just used it, which was not unusual. He would do it in other texts. But, and then, as was his custom, he added his own material to that, those paragraphs that I had suggested. And as he was reading his speech, his favorite gospel singer, who had been on the stage earlier and had sung, Mahalia Jackson sung a song, she shouts at him in the middle of his speech, tell him about the dream, Martin, tell him about the dream. And I watched him in real time acknowledge Mahalia Jackson, and he takes the written text of the speech that he was reading from and he moves it to the left side of the lectern. He grabs the podium, looks out on the street. This is all occurring in real time. I'm standing behind him. And I turn to the person next to me, whoever that person was, and I say, these people out there, they don't know it. But they're about ready to go to church. Because I could tell by his body language that he was getting to what I call the preacher's mode. I had heard and seen Martin Luther King Jr. speak many, many times in churches, mostly in public forums. So it was nothing new for me to listen and see him speak. This time, however, was different. This time, at 4 p.m., between 3.30 and 4 p.m. on Wednesday afternoon, August 28, 1963, at the foot of the Lincoln Memorial, before more than 250,000 people assembled, it's as if some cosmic force had come down, some invisible cosmic force, and had taken over his body. And although there was the same body that I had seen and the same voice I had heard, I had never heard him speak like that before. In the book that I wrote, Behind the Dream, The Making of the Speech, The Transformed the Nation, I described the process of trying to, looking at trying to capture lighten, lightning in a bottle. It was absolutely extraordinary. In the book, I also write, because I'm asked this question, well, how does that speech compare to the speech he gave just the night before he was going to be assassinated? He didn't know he was going to be assassinated, but he was, it was rainy. He was speaking in Memphis, Tennessee, in a Masonic temple. And this is where the speech he talked about, I've been to the mountaintop. And I've looked over the mountaintop, and I may not see you. I may not get there. I may not get there with you, but I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the promised land, and we as a people will get there, we'll be free. Magnificent speech, there's no question about it. No question about it. It was not the I Have a Dream speech. The I Have a Dream speech, which was spontaneous, the portion of the speech that he spoke in response to Mahalia Jackson 
was completely extemporaneous, was completely spontaneous, was not written down. There's no written text for that because it wasn't written down until after the speech. And in the speech, the reason I said we owe a great debt to Martin Luther King Jr., he was very prophetic. He had a greater prophetic belief in the goodness of America than I think America had for itself at the time, ahead of itself at the time. The phrase, I have a dream, wasn't talking about the present tense. In the earliest part of the speech, he talked about where the country was and the past of how we got there using my, my uh, uh, opening paragraphs about we've come here through class, through cash, the promissory note has been returned. Uh, uh, for unpaid funds and so forth. In the part of the speech that's become so celebrated and it's replayed on his birthday and it's replayed on April 4th, 1960, and April 4th, the date of his assassination, is that portion that quotes the I Have a Dream, but the quoted parts that have captured the world and the nation all speak prophetically about the future. I have a dream that one day my four children will be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. I have a dream that one day the great, great grandsons and daughters of slaves and slaveholders will sit down at the table of brotherhood and join hands together. The great confidence in America. The debt we owe is because not only was he able to take America through a nonviolent journey of recovery to overcome its addiction to racial segregation and reclaim its soul. But it's also, we have a debt because as I said, he thought not only about the present but the future. And so when I come here as an accidental beneficiary of longevity to speak about his legacy, I can look out at you and say confidently that you truly are the successor generation that he worked so hard and died for. He believed in 1963 that no matter how compelling or fair on the merits the case for ending racial segregation was, that it would be impossible for America to go through a peaceful transition of ending racial segregation unless 88% of the population came to understand that it was in its self-interest that 12% of the population, Negroes, be free. Because when America came to understand that, when the majority, when white people came to understand that it was in the, their own self-interest of being a great country, that's when we would make this, have this marvelous breakthrough. When he was introduced in 1964, in December 1964, by Gunnar Jarre, the chairman of the Nobel Peace, Prize Committee. Gunnar Jar said many things about Martin King as he was introducing him to come up and get his Nobel Peace Prize. But that portion of his presentation, which I remember and which was most powerful of all, is that he said, aside from Mahatma Gandhi in India, Martin Luther King Jr. is the only person in the Western world who was able to take 
okay, the most powerful industrial country in the world on a revolutionary, peaceful change to end segregation and to do it peacefully. Most, if you, if you study uh, uh, a lot about the different revolutions, you'll find that history is replete with revolutions that have been violent. A minority of those violent revolutions have been successful temporarily, such as in the Soviet Union, such as the coup in Libya that brought Colonel Gaddafi to power, such as the coup in, uh, Nas in Egypt that brought Colonel Nasser to power, and then Mubarak. But you will see now that there's a whole new movement across the world, particularly in the Middle East. It's been described as the Arab Spring. The spring is not over yet. But the dominant characteristic of that movement has been that there are millions and millions of young people, principally ages of like uh, 20, if not lower, 18 to 30 as the core, who were coming together, who came together nonviolently. On my iPad, I downloaded the English language version of Al Qazira, which is the Arab television, Arab language television. So during that period of time, I would look at the Arab newspapers and I would look at Arab television and see what they were actually covering. And I was astounded to see, which I also saw occasionally on American television, that as the television cameras covered the demonstrators in Tunisia and in Yemen, and particularly in Tahrir Square in Egypt, the only two posters and pictures of non-Arabic people that the demonstrators carried, the only pictures they carried, were Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. People in Egypt, in Yemen, and Tunisia were carrying Martin Luther King Jr. I will end by telling you a story to show the power of his legacy. Shortly after the election of Barack Obama, I was in Paris. I was invited to go to Paris to attend and participate in the ninth annual reunion of Nobel Peace Prize laureates. Those are all the people who had gotten Nobel Peace Prizes, uh, Senator, uh, President F.D. Leclerc from South Africa, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, from the Soviet Union, he was not there because he was ill, Black Valencia people, uh, Ingrid Betancourt from uh, Colombia, a lot of, most of the Nobel Peace Prize. Lec Valencia from Poland, who could speak no English, and who spoke to the people there through an interpreter. And when he learned who I was and spoke to me through an interpreter, he came over during the course of our meeting there and he grabbed my hand. And he said, Mr. Jones, you know, in Poland, we had watched American television and we had watched your Dr. King and civil rights demonstrators. And we particularly noticed that on many times when you were confronting authorities or after you thought you had a victory, you would sing this song, We Shall Overcome. You would sing that song. So we decided that we would learn the words of that song phonetically. We couldn't speak any English. We had somebody translate what the English meaning of the words were, but we sang the song phonetically. We knew we had won at the Gdansk shipyards in Poland, Mr. Jones, when 5,000 Polish shipyard workers stood in opposition to the Polish authorities, and they sang in unison we 
shall overcome. It was that day, it was that day that the Polish authorities succumbed to their demands. 5,000 Polish shipyard workers singing in English phonetically the words we shall overcome. That's the power, the world power of Martin Luther King Jr. So I am very pleased to have had the opportunity to come and share a little bit of his legacy with you and to come to remind you by being here of what I said earlier during my remarks, that if he were here today, he would remind you of the most important one of the most important things you can dedicate yourselves to, and that is to the pursuit of personal excellence, to be the very best that you can be, because as uh, the suggestor, as the successor generation to his legacy, you carry a great responsibility going forward. Our country needs you. The world needs you, and no greater fitting tribute could be paid to Martin Luther King Jr. today, tomorrow, next month, or next year than you be the best that you can be. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Lumire Fajolu, and I'm here as a representative from the Black History Month Committee. The students and faculty on the committee have worked together to plan all of the various celebrations throughout February, and we hope you all have enjoyed them as much as we have. Dr. Jones, thank you for being here today. We are honored to be in your presence and appreciate your willingness to visit us at Viewpoint School. Today's assembly has been a truly memorable one, something that we will never forget. I'm Lindsay Jordan, and as president of the student body, I'm excited to announce that through the recent student council fundraising efforts, the students have made a donation in Dr. Jones's name to the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute. Dr. Jones, thank you for the incredible gift that you've given us today. Please join me in thanking Dr. Jones with another round of applause. And now I'd like to invite Mr. Brundle and the Contemporary Vocal Ensemble to the stage. Walking by, singing. 
Thank you so much to our vocal jazz ensemble led by Mr. Brendel. The words to that song were actually altered today by Natalie Brain. And Natalie, step forward in honor of your visit, Dr. Jones. those years from 6 to 14 when every day I would hear Irish nuns <laughs> with <laughs> they would they would say such things to me they would first of all speak to me with such love they called me Master Jones and uh, the only the only commitment I have not fulfilled to Sister Mary Patricia was that I told her that when I was a young boy that someday when I grew up I would go to Ireland and I have not had a chance to do that. But, every, but when I sit and I, you just brought love to my ears. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My name is Bo Hanfajolu, the second semester student council president. And on behalf of the entire middle school and the fifth grade, we thank you for visiting our campus and speaking to the students and teachers. So let's give another big round of applause to Dr. Jer Clarence Jones. <laughs> now in honor of Dr. Jones' work, and to commemorate his visit to Viewpoint School, middle school and upper school raised money and will donate $900 to the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute in Dr. Jones' name. So let's give another round of applause to the guys, the work that you guys have done.
And now, the Middle School Multicultural Club will share a poem in honor of Black History Month. Um, we are proud to present a poem written by Paul Lawrence Dunbar called The Colored Soldiers. If the muse were mine attempted, and my feeble voice was strong, if my tongue were trained in measures, I sing a stern song. I sing a song heroic of those noble sons of Ham, the gallant colored soldiers who fought for Uncle Sam. In the early days, you scorned them, and with many a flip and flout, you said, these battles are the white man's, and the whites will fight them out. Up the hills you fought and faltered, in the vales you bled and said, that these, you will, your ears still heard the thunder of the foe's advancing tread. Then distress fell on the nation, and the flag was drooping low. Should dust pollute your banner? No, the nation shouted no. Then war in savage triumph spread abroad his funeral pall. Then you called the colored soldiers, and they answered to your call. Like hounds unleashed and eager for the lifeblood of the prey, sprung they forth and bore them bravely into the thickest of the fray. And where the fight was hottest, where the bullets fastest fell, there they pressed, unblanched and fearless, at the very mouth of hell. Ah, they rallied to the standard, to uphold it by their might. None were stronger in the labors, none were braver in the fight. To the blazing breach of Wagoner, to the plains of Old Steep, they were foremost in the fight for the battles of the free. And at Pillow, God have mercy on the, com on the, on the deeds committed there, in the souls of those poor soldiers victims sent to thee without a prayer. Let the fullness of thy pity or the hot rout spirit sway or the gallant colored soldiers who fell fighting on that day. Yes, the blacks enjoyed their freedom and they won it dearly too. For the lifeblood of their thousands did the southern fields bedew. In the darkness of their bondage, in the, in the depths of slavery's night, the muskets flashed the dawning and they fought their way to light. They were comrades and then brothers, are they more or less today? They were good to stop a bullet and fight their fearful prey. They were citizens and then soldiers, when, and when rebellion raised its head, and the traits that made them worthies, ah, their virtues are not dead. They have shared in nightly vigils, they have shared in daily toil, and with their blood, the fearless Canadian has enriched the southern soil. They have slept and marched and suffered beneath the same dark skies as you, they have met as fierce a foeman and have been as brave and true. And their deeds shall find a record in the registry of fame. For their blood has shed completely every blot of slavery shame. So all honor and all glory to those noble sons of Ham, the gallant colored soldiers who fought for Uncle Sam. Dr. Jones' legacy is right here. This is legacy. This is the gift, as we talked about on Friday in our assembly, our short assembly, this is the gift that we've been given in our lifetimes. Uh, I want to thank Ms. Russell and Mr. Uh, Garcia for helping the students to prepare for this and for setting up the whole assembly. And as Dr. Gorkowski said, of course, the Gilliards for enabling us to contact Dr. Jones and and be given the gift of his being here today. And I do have to thank Ms. Russell for letting me close this today because it completes a circle for me. My father was there. He was 300 yards away. He wasn't 25 feet away. I was born 11 days after that event. And as long as I've been alive, as you know, my father's been helping me to understand the importance of this. He was in Alabama. He was walking. He was confronting the same things that, that these leaders confronted. And for me, today, reminds me that this journey was completely worth it for all those who were involved. And it's all about you. As we said on Friday, you sit and play together and have lunch and, and do everything together without a second thought. That's a gift. It's a gift for us. We're old enough to understand the difference and see it happening. It's a gift to you that it doesn't occur to you. But we need to remember about it so that we can continue it and you can spread that message. So thank you so much, Dr. Jones. Can't have, cannot thank you enough. Could we give him one round of applause once more?
And remember his message, expect and achieve excellence within yourself. That's your obligation to the people who's come before us and done so much for us. So thank you, thank you for our student committee.